Hello and a very warm welcome to NGG's Australia-India Conversations. Australia-India ties are experiencing a new momentum, energy and enthusiasm, as both countries have signed the much-awaited interim trade deal, the Australia-India Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement, AI ECTA. The comprehensive Australia-India ECTA provides for competitive tariff elimination or tariff reduction on a wide range of goods and opens new services markets for suppliers across both markets. The aim is to enhance the bilateral trade to $45 billion in the next five years, currently at $27.5 billion, with a clear focus on job creation, enhanced mobility, mutual rec recognition of qualifications, and also increasing the exports uh, by over $100 billion uh, by 2030. Today we have with us uh, Peter Wagis Ao, who has had an extensive career in public service and diplomacy spanned over four decades. He has served as Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, was also Australia's High Commissioner to India, currently Chancellor of the University of Queensland, and is the acclaimed author of the India Economic Strategy to 2035, also known as IES 2035, commissioned by the Australian Prime Minister and was submitted in July 2018. Peter Wagis's report is, I would say, the first ever comprehensive roadmap that established the Australia-India economic engagement potential across sectors and states. It provided Australia an outlook on existing growth opportunities in the India market, and an ambition to deepen the bilateral economic ties. So let's hear it from Peter Wergis, his thoughts on the latest momentum in the bilateral ties and the opportunities as well as the road ahead. Thank you, Mr. Wergis. Uh, welcome to NGG's Australia India Conversations. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here with you and to discuss uh, the bilateral relationship and other issues. Pleasure to be speaking with you today, uh, Mr. Wergis. So what really are your thoughts on the recent assigned AI ECTA Will the deal really, you think, uh, prove itself to be a breakthrough in deepening Australia-India economic ties? Well, I think it's a very positive step. And given the, the long and somewhat tortuous history of these negotiations, I think to conclude an agreement, even if it is an interim agreement, agreement is um, um, a significant step forward. Um, Australia and India, of course, have had very differing levels of ambition when it comes to free trade agreements. Um, uh, for Australia, bilateral and uh, regional FTAs have been uh, really the centrepiece of our trade policy um, in the absence of a global multilateral trading round, which has um, basically disappeared for the time being anyway. Um, and so we have always brought as a country um, a very high level of ambition in the FTAs that we've negotiated. India's experience is quite different. I mean, in, India has concluded fewer of these FTAs. I think it's fair to say that FTAs are not the centerpiece of India's approach to uh, trade and investment. Um, and so reconciling these two uh, differing levels of ambition has really been at the core of uh, a decade plus negotiations um, up, to, up to now. So um, the agreement itself, I think, is sufficiently comprehensive to um, classify as a serious bilateral agreement. Um, I think getting 86% um, of uh, Australian exports uh, to India tariff-free um, is a higher number than I would have thought a few years ago. Um, and the number is even higher in terms of the, of the reverse direction. Um, I think it's a, a measure of the progress that we've made in these negotiations, that this is the most comprehensive FTA agreement that India has signed. Um, it may, be the least comprehensive FTA that Australia has signed, but it is sufficiently comprehensive, I think, uh, to be uh, a very welcome step. Um, now, whether, whether it's possible <clears throat> in the short to medium term to build on that achievement, 
uh, and move to a fully comprehensive agreement, I think time would tell, although my, my expectation is that we would remain in the interim uh, phase for a considerable period of, uh, of time. Um, now, what, what FTAs do is they don't in and of themselves fundamentally shift the dial on trade and investment because trade and investment isn't done by the two governments. Trade and investment is done by uh, the private sector and the business community with the encouragement and assistance of, uh, of government. Um, and what this will do, I think, is firstly um, have a head turning effect. I think it will signal to the Australian business community that um, India is a large and important market for Australia. Um, and that signaling is very important because the Australian corporate sector has had a somewhat mixed approach to uh, the Indian market. And similarly, it will signal to Indian business that Australia is a country which has much to offer as a partner for India uh, across trade and investment. Now, obviously, the elimination of barriers makes doing business easier. Um, I'm pleased that um, issues like taxation have also been uh, resolved um, off the back of this uh, ECTA agreement. Um, I think it's important that we have as robust a framework for investment between our two countries um, as possible, uh, because in my view, um, investment is going to be a very significant component of our broader uh, economic relationship and in many ways um, may be uh, a more important facilitator and promoter of trade uh, than traditional trade in, uh, in goods and services. Um, so if we're thinking about the trajectory of this relationship, um, I think this, uh, this agreement will certainly uh, be on the positive side uh, of the ledger, but it's really now uh, up to business communities and business entities to be looking at the Indian market, seeing where the opportunities are uh, and beginning the rather long process of market entry into India if they haven't been there before or if they have been there before um, expanding their, their, their operations. So I think in terms of where we want to end up in the, in the medium to longer term, this is going to be an important stepping stone. So very interesting insight when you mentioned about most comprehensive uh, from the Indian standards, but maybe least comprehensive from the Australian standards. Now, a few things which are repeatedly being said, uh, especially uh, with the visit of uh, the Commerce Minister last uh, two weeks ago uh, to uh, uh, Australia with the largest ever uh, business delegation uh, just prepared in 36 hours. Uh, and he mentioned that new India is ready for business uh, if the deals are reciprocal, non-discriminatory and equitable. And that's what you know, uh, repeatedly is being promoted by the government of India, that that's how they are looking for this engagement. From that perspective, do you see that Australia has now uh, got a first mover advantage in, a, in an economy like India, seeing uh, the fact that uh, it's an agreement signed uh, uh, with a developed economy after a gap of 10 years? Yeah, well, I think there are many movers in the Indian market, um, but the fact that this is the first FDA with a mature developed economy such as Australia um, is important. Uh, I think the fact that it did include agriculture, although not uh, as comprehensively as I'm sure some Australian uh, agricultural industry people would like, uh, is also significant. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think it, it sets us up well. Um, the extent to which it will end up delivering a first mover advantage, I think, will really depend on how business on both sides um, approach the opportunities. And, you know, I think this is where investment really becomes a very important part of the future relationship because it's the synergies between trade and investment, which I think is underdeveloped in our relationship with India. Indeed, it's underdeveloped in our relationship with most of our Asian 
markets. I mean, traditionally, Australia has a uh, profile of economic engagement in Asia, which is high on trade and low on investment. Now, there's some exceptions to that, including, including Japan and Singapore. Um, but I think what we have with India is an opportunity to bring into better balance the trade and investment side uh, of the relationship and to grow both um, simultaneously. And I hope that's you know, where, we, where we end up heading in, uh, in this relationship. Um, and that includes the value add agenda, it includes you know, how Australia and India can partner in um, sectors such as food processing, uh, minerals value add, minerals processing. I mean, it's a, it's a big agenda. Any specific sectoral engagements you think are likely to pick up with this uh, uh, AI XR trade deal? And also, what are your expectations? Uh, the fact that the government is aiming to conclude a comprehensive, the full SICA by end of this year, uh, any specific areas you think are still missing out and should be covered in the full deal? Yeah, well, I, I think in terms of specific sectors, um, I mean, in, in, in my report, um, I included education, resources, and agribusiness as three of the top four um, sectoral opportunities for India and, uh, India and Australia, and tourism was the, was the fourth. Um, I think all three of those um, are advanced by this agreement um, and the side arrangements that go with it. I mean, I think the... Um, agreement to look at mutual recognition of education qualifications is uh, potentially a significant step because um, we still need to see the outcome of that, uh, of that process, but it is potentially uh, a very significant step. I think the focus we've given to mining and mining related services in ECTA uh, and the work we're doing that's complementary in relation to critical minerals um, will mean that the um, resources sector uh, will be helped by uh, the agreement. Uh, it's, a, it's a more mixed picture, I think, when it comes to agriculture, because they are um, areas that are still excluded from trade liberalization in this agreement. And I guess that would be the focus of the negotiations on um, a, a final comprehensive agreement, those areas that have been um, left out of this agreement and we can, we'll see whether it's possible to uh, bring them into a, into, a, into a comprehensive agreement. But, you know, it's like life more generally, you, you don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. And to the extent that you can uh, take positive steps forward, and they keep you moving in the right direction and they're consistent with your policy settings uh, and they respond to business interest and business priorities, then you know, it's, um, it's clearly something, um, something worth doing. Um, I think if we can, if we can have um, a more comprehensive um, investment framework between the two countries, uh, under the auspices of a, of, of a final comprehensive agreement that would obviously also uh, be uh, a welcome step forward. And I think if you take the sort of structure of, the, uh, of ECTA and you add to it the sort of enhanced emphasis that we also want to give to um, an economic dialogue with, uh, with India, the way in which we want to bring our two bureaucracies into into closer contact i mean you can see um, that we're looking to broaden the foundations of this uh, uh, of this economic relationship because uh, that policy dialogue in my view is um, is extremely important i mean it's uh, it's important for australia and india to understand where each is coming from in terms of their broader policy framework and I think we can learn from each other in terms of the challenges of opening up an economy. Um, I think the history of India's um, economic growth is that the more open its economy is, both internally and externally, 
uh, the better it performs. And I think the same applies in spades to uh, the Australian economy. Um, now, we have different domestic political challenges in terms of how we prosecute the case for um, uh, an economy that's getting more open, more outward looking. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't learn from, uh, from each other, including in relation to um, you know, our, our economic policy settings. Um, India's um, reform agenda is obviously um, both a complicated and a very broad one, but one of the areas where Prime Minister Modi has been particularly focused is on bureaucratic reforms, on the capacity of the Indian system to uh, deliver effectively on government policies. Um, and again, you know, Australia has itself been through over a long, long period of time, really starting in the 1980s, um, a fairly um, comprehensive program of, uh, of bureaucratic reform, the way in which our public service operates, the relationship between officials and ministers, uh, the way in which um, cabinet government works to deliver a national strategy. I mean, all of these things, I think we can benefit from um, talking more to each other about. And I'm, I'm glad that um, amongst the many announcements that uh, uh, the governments have made, it includes the strengthened dialogue between uh, the two countries. Something that your report has also very comprehensively, com comprehensively covered uh, uh, in terms of uh, you know building on these uh, policy uh, uh, linkages and trying to understand the India market uh, better means uh, you know if if uh, one one reads your report thoroughly the one common theme all throughout has been to understand the India market uh, uh, better. The, in terms of the India economic strategy update uh, and just coming from the point where you mentioned about how it's important to understand the reforms that are happening in India. Uh, and we have seen uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, government, uh, uh, even in the first term, they mentioned about uh, uh, minimum government and maximum governance, also the model of competitive cooperative federalism, how states uh, and center are working together. Uh, if we look at the updated IES, uh, which was recently released by the trade minister, keeping in view the post-COVID economic recovery goals, it, it has made allocations uh, to strengthen linkages with India's key policy and finance institutions. Uh, it's also talked about enhanced business engagement and corporate literacy, increasing or straight presence in India, uh, and strong focus on uh, diaspora connect uh, through other allocations. Uh, what's your view on the updated IES 2035? And uh, out of your experience in public diplomacy, uh, how do you see increased allocations really converting themselves into tangible gains? Yeah, well, look, I think it made a lot of sense to update the IES. I mean, um, I delivered it in uh, July 2018. It was essentially written uh, in 2017, and a lot has happened um, in the meantime. Um, not only COVID, although COVID is probably the most um, dramatic change in our environment between 2018 and today, but we're also seeing uh, a very different global economic outlook. Uh, we're seeing slower economic growth uh, in uh, many, if not most countries, including, including in, uh, in India. Uh, we're seeing a slowing of uh, globalization. Uh, we're seeing potentially a um, measure of decoupling in the global economy as the US-China relationship takes uh, a different turn. Um, and you've got a productivity challenge um, facing many, many countries, particularly uh, developed countries where almost across the board, the productivity story has been one of, uh, of declining productivity. So um, I, I think, you know, updating the IES was a prudent thing for uh, the government to do. Uh, it's also the fact that the case that um, there are some areas which now have a higher prominence than they did in 2018. I mean, space is one, critical minerals is another. Um, 
I mean, I, I included critical minerals in my report, but as part of the broader resources sector. Um, and so we should be um, looking to see what we can do in those uh, in those newish uh, in those newish areas. Um, on the, the broader public diplomacy point um, that you raised, I mean, I, I think the announcement of a center for Australia-India relations is a very welcome um, development. I think the funding that goes with it is even more welcome because quite often um, you can make a splash by announcing a new um, organization or unit, uh, but then not see very much resources devoted to it. Um, so $280 million invested in different areas of the bilateral relationship, I think, is a measure of seriousness on the part of the, uh, of the Australian government. And um, this new centre, there's still a lot of details to be worked out about how it will be structured and um, um, what its um, operating uh, mechanisms will be. But I think... Um, looking at questions of broader India literacy uh, is important because um, we do need to understand India better in Australia. I, I think our knowledge of India is not deep um, and, needs to, and needs to improve. Um, I think if you look at issues like India studies in Australian universities, we were probably doing more in the 1960s than we're doing today. So I think that whole literacy agenda is, uh, is very important. Um, the emphasis on the diaspora is something I welcome because I included it really as one of three supporting pillars for the relationship um, after geopolitics and, uh, and economics. And um, I remain um, very much of the view that the future of this relationship is going to be very strongly influenced by uh, the role that the diaspora um, can play. Um, and I see the Indian diaspora as not only a very important bridge to the economic relationship, but I also see the Indian diaspora as playing a much more significant role um, in the longer term in Australian politics as well. And that in turn, I think, will make sure that uh, this relationship sort of retains a priority um, amongst Australian governments, federal and state. But I think it's also the case that Australia has a very underdeveloped view about what is the best way to maximise the utility and the contribution that diaspora communities can make, and not just the Indian diaspora. I mean, I think, you know, we're a very multicultural society and we have diasporas from many parts of the world in Australia. And while I think we've had a kind of immigration slash multicultural framework of thinking when it comes to the diaspora, we haven't really developed um, a strong strategy or framework when it comes to uh, the role of the diaspora in business relationships. And that's what I hope, you know, the centre as well as um, other initiatives that have been taken um, can achieve because, you know, ultimately we need to see diaspora groups as a shared resource um, and countries like India and China have a much more long-standing and sophisticated approach to um, utilizing uh, the value of the diaspora in advancing their interests in the bilateral relationship. And I think Australia should be doing something equally sophisticated, but tailor-made to uh, the um, Australian environment. So I, I hope um, this will be one of the more significant medium to long term uh, benefits. Um, I think the study that um, was released at the same time as the update to the IES on the diaspora is a, is a very good um, step in that direction. I think it gives us a, uh, a clearer picture, a clearer map of uh, the nature of this diaspora. 
<clears throat> but it's transferring the headline uh, intuitive judgment about the diaspora being an asset into a more detailed strategy. And um, um, quite a lot of work needs to be done on that, I think. Right, and uh, as, as you rightly said, that you'd also mentioned this as, as a key pillar uh, in, in your report, that how diaspora's talent, skills, and network can be utilized in a big way to really you know, uh, push this relationship uh, on several fronts, on economic front, on, on a larger public engagement basis, but remains to be seen because the report calls it an asset report, but to convert this asset in a real potential, uh, yeah. uh, you know, something where you know, all, the, all, the, all the measures which the, current, which the government currently is taking uh, through through uh, the Center for Australia and their relations and several other me measures through the investment um, will, will play uh, a very key uh, role. Uh, uh, just trying to understand more also through the geostrategic and geoeconomic uh, implications, Mr. Waghi, is, uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, what do you see will uh, uh, this particular trade deal and the closer engagement between both uh, countries, Australia and India, with respect to the role of economies in the Indo-Pacific, and in Quad, and do you foresee a scenario where uh, a stronger bilateral engagement will also make way for a stronger multilateral engagement, uh, turning it into a reality in, 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 in groupings like the RCEP or even APEC, if I may say so? Yeah, so well, um, on RCEP, I mean, from an Australian perspective, it was very disappointing that um, in the end, India chose to stay outside of RCEP. I mean, I think we all understand the domestic calculations that sat behind that and the concerns about um, how Indian interests might be affected, um, particularly uh, in relation to China. But, you know, it goes back to the point I was making earlier that uh, India does best when it is most open. And uh, the more India um, integrates into trade and investment groupings that have a liberalization agenda at their heart, I think um, the better it will be for India's long-term prospects. But at the end of the day, that's a judgment for India. It's not a judgment for, uh, for uh, Australia to make. Um, I've for a long time been an advocate of uh, bringing India into APEC. And uh, in my report, I recommended that we actually take um, uh, a lead in that process. Um, APEC itself, of course, I think has probably dipped a bit in terms of uh, the focus that countries have on APEC. And I think the APEC trade liberalization agenda in a sense has been um, a victim or collateral damage in terms of the broader sort of slowing down of um, regional multilateral trade liberalization, not not to mention global uh, trade liberalization, but you know, APEC still, in my view, has um, a role to play when it comes to uh, areas like trade facilitation, when it comes to just trying to keep alive the ambition of trade liberalization, when it comes to sort of um, peer comparisons about how different economies in the region are approaching trade and investment liberalization. And so I think um, uh, having an economy the size of India's um, in um, an Asia Pacific regional grouping just makes a lot of sense. I mean, the, the reason why India was not included in APEC from the outset is that um, India historically has been on the sidelines of the Asia Pacific Trade and Investment Integration Project. But that's changed um, and it's continuing to change. I mean, as India strengthens its economic linkages to East Asia, as India pursues and, you know, an act East policy, as India's own economic interests pull it closer to Southeast Asia and to um, Northeast Asia as well. Um, that picture will start looking uh, very different and um, having India on the outer uh, will make less and less sense, I think, from the point of view of other, uh, of other APEC um, economies. So um, I think anything we can both do, Australia and India, to keep you know, advancing the trade and investment liberalisation agenda 
um, is worth doing, um, accepting that we will not bring identical uh, perspectives um, to this. And again, you know, our levels of ambition uh, may, be, uh, may be a bit different. Um, I think the other very, very significant trend that we're all going to have to grapple with is the way in which um, geoeconomics now is being reshaped um, as a consequence both of lessons people think they've learned from COVID, uh, but also in the way in which uh, there is this um, emerging fault line now uh, between China and Russia uh, on the one hand and um, other countries, particularly what we used to call the West uh, on the other. And um, India's place in that is going to get a bit more complicated in my view, um, not least because of the India-Russia relationship and We've seen this with, uh, with the Ukraine, we've seen it with the um, uh, level of discomfort India has uh, in joining uh, a broader international condemnation of uh, Russia's invasion of, uh, of Ukraine. We've seen it in their abstentions uh, in, in, in the UN. Um, and um, this more complicated cleavage in global geopolitics, um, I think, will uh, also complicate India's balancing act. Now, where I think Australia and India are very much on the same page uh, is in having a shared concern uh, about the implications of China becoming the predominant power in the Indo-Pacific region. I think each of us for our own reasons, and they're, they're, they aren't identical reasons by any, any means, but nevertheless, each of us for our own reasons uh, is uncomfortable with that prospect. Um, and I think each of us in our own way is looking for a new strategic equilibrium in the Indo-Pacific and a new framework, uh, which both engages China, because I don't think either of us want to walk completely away from engaging with China, but which can also constrain China where, where China, uh, when China's behavior crosses a red line or breaches international norms or you know, cuts across um, what other countries in the region consider to be um, acceptable behavior. Now, I think the fact that China itself has strengthen its connection to Russia is going to make that more complicated for India. Um, and to put it at its simplest, um, how does it, India continue to work with the United States to constrain China while China works with Russia to constrain the United States? Um, now, I'm not saying that that is uh, impossible for India to navigate. Um, and I don't think anyone expects India to um, abdicate its position on strategic autonomy. Um, but sometimes strategic autonomy does require you to take a position on something. Um, and um, those pressures, I think, will probably grow for India. So that's an interesting insight because uh, balancing is something which uh, the Indian diplomacy uh, going forward will have to uh, navigate uh, and the challenges that comes with it in terms of how do you balance your relationship with a certain country vis-a-vis -vis also uh, maintain the economic relationship with other countries and that's something uh, going forward we'll have to see as we uh, see the changing uh, world and the current channel cha challenges. Uh, but finally, uh, uh, Mr. Wargis, uh, what really uh, you know would you wish to see from here on going forward on bilateral ties, uh, uh, consolidating the gains made through your report and the engagements, what really is your wish list from here? Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, what we want out of this relationship remains uh, broadly consistent. I, I don't think that is, um, that is shifting. I think what's, what is happening, and it's a very positive development, is that the pace at which we're moving 
towards what we want in the relationship seems to be quickening. And there's no question in my mind that at the moment we're at a high point in this relationship, which uh, has both geopolitical drivers behind it and um, um, increasingly now economic drivers. So, you know, where, where do we want to end up? Well, um, as I said in my report, we want to see India in the first tier of our strategic partnerships. And I think we are well on the way to doing that. Um, we want to see a uh, economic relationship, which is um, much more substantial than it is now um, with uh, uh, India being uh, in uh, the top three of our markets, both in terms of trade and investment when it comes to uh, when it comes to Asia and um, a people to people relationship as close as any that we have in, in Asia. So um, the outlines, I think, are pretty clear. I think the progress we're making um, is also quite brisk at the moment. Um, there will inevitably be ups and downs uh, in the relationship uh, into the future. Um, but, you know, the ultimate test is how congruent are our core economic and strategic interests. And on that, I think we're, uh, we're discovering that there is a very large measure of, uh, of congruence. Um, and um, I think we just need to, we need to build on that. Um, it is very important, I think, that um, the Australian corporate sector, particularly the big end of town, um, focuses more on the Indian market than they have in the past. And um, it's never been my position that every large corporate needs to be active in India, because for many large corporates, uh, it won't make business sense for them, that it wouldn't fit into their strategies. Um, but every large corporate should at least be asking themselves the question, um, should I be in India or can I afford not to be in India? Um, and that's still, in my view, what's missing in terms of um, the big end of town. It's changing and it's changing in the right direction. And ECTA will, as I said, you know, turn heads in a way that um, they mightn't have been turned before. Um, but if you, if you work on the premise that India is going to um, end up being the third largest economy um, by 2035, as I did in my, in my report. Um, and when you look at the structural complementarities between uh, our two economies, then um, it's quite clear that this is um, already a consequential relationship that has a lot of growth tissue uh, left in it. Right. So uh, with this hope that we see solid business outcomes uh, going forward with the AI ECTA trade deal and, and hopefully enhanced uh, collaboration, commitment and consistency in these ties, something uh, uh, which uh, the bilateral tries have missed in the past. But the, the momentum that this relationship has gained since uh, 2020 and uh, the, the roadmap provided by you uh, in your report at, uh, through the India Economic Strategy 2035. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Verghese, uh, for your time uh, today. Uh, pleasure speaking with you. My pleasure and all the best. Thank you.